blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law he meditates day and night. It will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff which the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. But the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Our Father, we want to be that man, the wise man, who doesn't walk in the path of sinners and doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers. So this morning as we open your word, we delight in the opening of your word. Not just in opening it, but in hearing uh, what you would have to teach us this morning. That we might rightly respond uh, in a way that brings honor to your name. So Father, I know this is a familiar passage, and yet, even for me, it was so encouraging, so hopeful. So I pray this morning as you... Teach us your word, that you would use this very word, that it would not return void, that it would accomplish the very purpose for which you sent it, that the people of God would be equipped for the good work that's ahead, and that the lost would come to know Jesus as their Savior. And so may he be exalted this morning. We ask in his name. Amen. All right, turn to John chapter 11. Over the past seven weeks, Uh, We've been working through a series in the book of John that we're simply calling I Am. Uh, They're based on the seven I Am statements that Jesus made. And each of these statements were claims that that he made to to declare that he is God in human flesh. Nobody really doubted that that argument that he made. Although I've had many people in in past years that have come and said, well, Jesus never said he was God. Well, it's clear. (laughs) Over and over and over again, he declared to be God. And so we've talked about a few of these statements. He said, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the gate. I am the shepherd. And and, then working through these, every single one of them was Jesus saying, I'm God in human flesh. And as we've worked through this, there's been mixed reactions. And we've seen it uh, in our group and we've also you see it in the scriptures you know these are bold claims that he made and and for many it caused some to believe and to trust in jesus and for others uh, who chose to reject him they just got angrier and angrier and angrier because they understood that jesus as a man was declaring himself to be god and they wanted to kill him for it in fact, look at John 10, verse 31. It says here, the Jews picked up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, I showed you many good works from the Father. For which of them are you stoning me? The Jews answered him, for a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. Because you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. And so these statements that Jesus made don't really allow for a neutral view of Jesus Christ. And there are many around the world who would love to have the fruit of Christianity, but they just want it without Christ. I was preaching in a church in Ukraine three weeks ago, and uh, now understand, we had gotten there on a, on a Thursday night, uh, about nine o'clock at night by the time we got to uh, the apartment, and, and then taught all day Friday and all day Saturday, and, uh, and in between Friday and Saturday, I taught for 21 hours in those two days. And then I'm preaching on Sunday morning, and, uh, and, and right after the sermon was over, uh, getting ready to go with my family, we're going to go get lunch. And one of the pastors grabbed me and he says, hey, we've got this group of unbelievers here. Um, they've come for food. Church is, is, is over. And, and, and can you come and share a message with them? I'm done. I was done at that point. You know, I was in the I'm done mindset. And, and I just preached. I mean, I just preached for an hour plus. You know, the day, two days before, and there's, there's this group of hungry people that come to this church every <laughs> Sunday um, to get a warm meal. So what do you say? And so I'm, I'm going through this in my mind, like I was I'm being ushered from one room to another room, and and uh, 
and my brain is just fried. And, and so I always tell people whenever they say, you know, when they say, well, what should I teach? They say, well, just teach whatever God's teaching you. And so I'm thinking, well, what has God been teaching me? And I'm sort of just running from one place to another. Oh, yeah, we're sort of working on these I am statements. And, and, and I started thinking back through that and immediately thought of Jesus feeding a group of thousands of hungry people with just five loaves of bread and two fish. And I really didn't have any time to prepare. I didn't even have time for notes. There was no podium up there or anything else. It was just, hey, you go stand in this circle of people who are poor and hungry and, and you feed them the word of God. And uh, I said, you know, and I told about the story of Jesus and feeding these hungry people. And I said, you know, the problem though came when they only really wanted Jesus because of what he was going to give them, the food that he was going to give them. They didn't really want Jesus himself. Like they wanted the food of Jesus. They wouldn't, didn't want Jesus. And, and so when he starts talking about symbolically eating of my flesh and drinking of my blood, like people get really mad about that. And so they left. So kind of the natural reaction then is, so what about you? Like, why are you here? Are you here because of the food for Je that Jesus gives you through this church? Or are you here because you really want Jesus? And this lady starts yelling at me. Which is not bad because like, she's yelling in Russian, like, I don't understand. I mean, you can just kind of tell when somebody's mad at you and you're just like, you know, nodding and smiling. And, um, I looked at my translator and he said, she's agreeing with you. And I said, yeah, I'm sure she is. <laughs> and about that time, this guy walks up, old man. He, he actually found out later, he was sitting right behind Sherry. And, and she just spoke of this stench that came off of him that just, he just dumped. And he came up and, and he said, uh, he talked to my translator. And I said, what does he want? He said he wants to repent and trust in Jesus right now. Wow. And there in that room, this big circle of hungry people, that there's the, he gets on his knees. And he prays a prayer that I didn't understand, but I understood what he was praying. He received the bread of life. So today we're in John 11. We're a little bit out of order, right? We did John, Tom did John 14. I was kind of vacillating a little bit on my, my trip dates and stuff like that. So, but I think the timing is perfect. And so John 11, I think you're going to find is, especially if you've been in the Bible for a while, you, it's going to be familiar to you. It's actually three sermons tied into one. I mean, you could do a sermon easily at the very beginning about uh, Jesus raising Lazarus from death. Right? It wasn't his, wasn't his last miracle, but it could easily be seen as certainly one of his greatest miracles. It was the miracle that got the most response from his friends and his enemies. I mean, here you've got a guy named Lazarus who's been in the grave for four days. The Jewish leaders couldn't deny that he was dead. They couldn't avoid the fact that Jesus had raised him from death. We can easily do a sermon on that, right? We could also do a sermon on... Uh, on faith, because eight times in John 11, you see the word believe or faith in there. And so that, that it kind of permeates the whole, uh, the whole chapter. And then you also see this theme in, in John 11 where, where Jesus is really seeking to strengthen the faith of the people, of his followers. And so in, in 1 to 16, he's trying to strengthen the faith of his disciples. And then you see in 17 to 40, he's trying to strengthen the faith of Mary and Martha. And then in 41 to 57, the, the Jews, he wants to strengthen their faith. Like, man, you only got one week, though. What do you do for one week? You know, how do you, how do you put all that in one week? And so uh, we're just going to, we're going to combine all of that into one. I think it's going to make sense when we're done. And, and so in, in John 11, I'm just going to read a portion of our text this morning to kind of get a, an overview. And then we'll come back and pick it apart one verse at a time. Uh, so let's look at John 11. We'll begin in verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been dead in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. Martha, therefore, when she had heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. 
Even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now, some of you know this passage of scripture here will be forever etched in my mind. Um, I had shared the gospel with my dad about a year before he passed. And I never really knew where he stood. You know what I mean? He, he just, yeah, I believe that, but I, I'm like, not really sure where, where if he embraced it, or if it was just intellectual or whatever. And um, it, it was just hard to tell. And my dad was on his deathbed, and, and uh, I think it was probably two days before he passed. And I remember just reading verses 25 and 26. And it says, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even if he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will live, will never die. I'm sorry. Do you believe this? And I just, I read that and I said, Dad, do you believe this? Yeah. I said, Dad, you realize that everyone who believe, lives and believes in Jesus will never die. And I remember my dad looking at me. He just had this smile on his face and he said, that's the best part of it all. And I thought, yeah, it really is. Everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. You believe this? You get to Lazarus. I mean, this is the seventh miracle in the book of John. It's really the climax. It's Jesus defeating death and Lazarus before he defeated death in himself. Really, that, that, that's got to be the culmination of it all, right? Is defeating death. I mean, if, if you think about it, like if Jesus doesn't, can't defeat death, does anything else he does really matter? Like, does it really matter that he was able to feed thousands, right? Does it really matter that, that he was able to walk on water? Does it really matter that he was able to heal people from diseases? Like make lame people walk. I mean, does that really matter if he can't defeat death, right? That's our biggest enemy. And if he can't beat that, like, who cares, right? In fact, look how Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, then we are of all men most to be pitied. Like, if this is all we get right here. This Jesus right here. We, we get to go to church on Sunday. Like, if this is all there is in the Christian life, really? Like, if you can't defeat death, what a profound statement that is. If, if Jesus, if we, if we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are of all men must to be pitied. And, and yet, the heart of the prosperity gospel, what is it? Place your hope in Christ. Why? In, for this life. So in this life, you can get what you want, you can get when you want it, in this life. It's as if the world is our home. It's as if God expects us all to find our greatest joy and peace and contentment and hope and love in what this life in this world has to offer. Look at John 15, verse 18. Jesus said, if the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, but because of this, the world hates you. The beauty of the Christian life is not that our only hope is in this life. The beauty of the Christian life is that our hope is in eternal life and that we live this life for that life. Right? That, that's why death is not our greatest enemy. In fact, Paul said that the death is, is great gain for the Christian. To live is Christ, he said. To, to die is gain. Well, to live is anything other than Christ, and to die, to die is a great loss. But if to live is Christ, you'll never die. Death is actually gain for you. This is a fascinating passage. We can probably spend 45 minutes just on the outline of it. But let's go back. John 11, we'll start in verse 1. And I think we're going to get all the way through 44. Let's see what happens. 
uh, John 11, verse 1, he says, Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was the Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet when her, with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Now listen, Bethany is, is east of the Mount of Olives. It's a couple miles from Jerusalem. Um, it's where Jesus stayed in his final week on the earth. Now we don't know a whole lot about Mary and Martha from here. Luke adds a little bit more detail. Let's, let's look at Luke's detail about Mary and Martha. Luke chapter 10, verse 38. Now as they were traveling along, he entered the village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister called Mary who was seated at the Lord's feet, listening to his word. But Martha was distracted with all her preparations, and she came to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the serving alone? Then tell her to help me. But the Lord answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Listen, the point of that text is not that we don't need to do household chores, right? That's not the point of the text. The point of the text is, is listening to and obeying Jesus is a higher priority than anything else, including household chores. But you see this huge contrast, don't you, between Mary and Martha? You get Mary, she sits and listens to Jesus. And Martha cooks a meal. What was the important thing? Yeah, listening to Jesus. It was what Mary chose to do. Now, how many Marthas do we got out there? Right? There's just a bunch of Marthas, right? We, we want to work, we want to do stuff. And, and I got to tell you, just to be real careful that you don't find yourself too busy to spend time sitting at the feet of Jesus and listening to what he has to tell you. Look at verse 3. So the sisters sent word to him saying, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Now, I love the, the assumption that these sisters make. First, they know Jesus is able, right? I mean, this is kind of a precursor here. But why would he tell them? Well, because you're able to do something about it. Second, he knows that, they, that he loves, they know that he loves their brother. And there's this mentality, right, where, well, since he loves their brother, since he's able to heal their brother, it would only make sense then, right, if he would heal their brother. Isn't that kind of the way we look at things? Isn't that kind of like our, our, our prayer, right? Like, Jesus, I know you're this. I know you can heal. I know you can uh, help them recover. I know you can turn this kid around. I know you can do this, save my marriage, get rid of the alcohol. I know you can do all of these things. And I know you love us. So you will. Right? We kind of get in that mentality. And, and in them, he's like, well, he loves Lazarus and he can't heal him. Well, then, duh, he's going to come and heal him. Except he doesn't. Look at verse 4. But when Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness is not the end in death, but for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was sick, he then stayed two days longer in the place where he was. What? He heard he was sick, and so he stays. Yeah, that makes sense, right? I mean, why wouldn't Jesus run to help Lazarus? In fact, Jesus didn't even need to run to help Lazarus. He could have helped Lazarus from where he was at. He could have just said the word, right? I mean, that's what he did with the centurion's son. And it goes to reason, right? If you love Mary and Martha and Lazarus, well, then there's no need that he would wait two, or two days to go. Why in the world would he do that? Well, point number one in your outline is there's a broader perspective. It's a broader perspective. It's sickness for glory. It's a broader perspective. And listen, Josh said it earlier today, waiting is hard. I mean, the whole idea of the Advent season is that we're waiting, waiting for the coming of Christ. And in our case, we're waiting for the second coming of Christ. And in this case, what was Jesus waiting on? The Father's timing. He's waiting on him to make sure Lazarus was good and dead. In my case, I waited all week for a kidney stone to pass. Man, that's fun. And I'm like, Jesus, if you love me and you can heal me, then, you know, you would, right? I mean, why would you wait till Saturday? 
you know? Boy, it's so easy, isn't it, to just focus on our circumstances and forget that there's a good product perspective. We get to see that God's doing something in you. We get to see that God's doing something in you. We get that God has a bigger purpose, a broader perspective than we have. It, it's just so easy to focus on this is where God has me right now, and this has got to be the biggest thing in the world. And, and the broader perspective here is for glory. This sickness is for glory. And the irony in all of this is that Jesus raising Lazarus from death is going to lead to Jesus' death. But Jesus' death is also going to lead to glory. I mean, most of us, even if you're not real familiar with the Bible, you've heard about Jesus raising Lazarus from death. But, but can you imagine like being in the story, right? Being part of that story. Can you imagine being Mary or Martha in the story and you're wondering, like, why are you, why are you waiting two more days? I mean, I understand it if Mary and Martha are dirtbags, right? They're unfaithful. I understand that if Lazarus is an enemy and then you go, like, oh, well, you know what? Time is just not good right now. I'm going to wait a couple of days. But, but they're faithful. And these are faithful sisters. Lazarus is a, is a good friend. But the broader perspective, though, is this is for the Father's glory. It's sickness for glory. Look at verse 7. And after this, he said to the disciples, let's go to Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were just now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Okay, now listen, we have information that they, they didn't have. We know he's going to, La, to Judea to raise Lazarus from death. They didn't know that. You know what they knew? They knew that Judea was dangerous for them. They knew that in Judea is where they wanted to kill Jesus. They knew that Judea was a place that they had escaped from when the religious leaders tried to stone Jesus to death. And so it only makes sense to go. Well, Jim, you can heal him from over here. Like, we don't need to go back over there, right? I mean, why would the world go back to Judea? That doesn't make any sense at all. Well, I'll just tell you the broader perspective rarely makes sense. The broader perspective is when God works in these unusual ways to bring about unusual results that result in, in his glory and our good. The broader perspective is Jesus dying for sins first and then coming back to rule and reign as Israel's king. See, the broader perspective is, is, is Paul going to Rome. He knew he was going to go to Rome. He thought he was going to Rome as a preacher. He didn't realize he was going as a prisoner. The broader perspective is a guy named Joseph who gets sold into slavery because decades later he's going to have to rescue uh, the Hebrew people. That's the broader perspective. The, God, the broader perspective is God working out some crazy thing that's going on in your life right now that's for His glory and for your good. And right now the circumstances are so big that you go, it doesn't make any sense. Why in the world would He wait four days? And so here you got Mary and Martha. What are they doing? They're not going, oh, I know what John 11 says. Like I've read the end of John 11. Like I know He's going to be raised from death. They don't say that. They're just worried. And they're mourning. The disciples? They're not going, hey, one day our names, you know, we're part of the 12, right? They're not thinking that. They're just thinking, we're going to die. We keep following this guy, and we're going to die. That's where we're at. Look at verse 9. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. You know, oftentimes Jesus speaks in this veiled sort of way. This is one of those times. So just to summarize, and not spend a lot of time here, he's speaking of walking and living in physical light versus darkness, right? But he's also speaking about walking in the spiritual realm. The idea is that when you, when you live by the will of God, when you obey God, that you're supernaturally cared for by Him. And as long as they followed Him, they were invincible. But until the appointed time, as long as they obeyed Him, they were invincible, they were untouchable. We spoke about this, remember when Jesus said, I am the light of the, of the world. In other words, like respond to Christ while He's still there, right? Respond to Christ today because today is being offered. Soon he's going to be gone, and that this unique opportunity 
would also be gone. That's the point. Look at verse 11. It says, This he said, and after that he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep. But I go so that I may waken him out of sleep. The disciples then said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, we'll recover. Well, if he's just fallen asleep, we don't need to go all the way to Judea, right? Where they want to kill us. He'll wake up. I mean, when Jesus said sleep, though, he's talking about sleep of death. Right? Oftentimes you see in the scripture where sleep is, is death, right, for the Christian. They thought he was talking about Lazarus having the, the sleep of sickness. And you know, he's on his way to healing, and Jesus is going to help him along. Broader perspective, look at verse 13. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought he was speaking of literal sleep. There's a broader perspective, and they don't get it. And also that comes with a broader perspective. Point number two is that there's a bigger purpose. Not just sickness for glory, but death for faith. So the bigger purpose is that death is for faith. Don't, don't you love, I, I love when I read the Bible and, and you, you, see, you see where Jesus is like speaking of one thing and the disciples are on a completely different page. Right? It's, it's, it's so humorous. You know, not like we ever would do that, right? Um, but, but that's what happens here. Like they, they, they think, oh, he's just sick. Like he'll be okay. And Jesus is going, no, he's actually dead. So look how blunt Jesus is, verse 14. So Jesus then said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Don't you love that? Uh, oh, by the way, Lazarus is dead. And then, I mean, if that's not enough, look at verse 15. And I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. I, I wonder in him saying this, if there was this pause, right? Lazarus is dead, and I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. That makes no sense at all. I mean, they're on a completely different page. It's a broader perspective. And now we see that God has a bigger purpose in all this. And the bigger purpose in all of this is for their faith. Did you see that? Verse 15, I'm glad for your sakes that I was not there. So that, there's the so that, so that you may believe. It's, it's for your faith. And, and I would say, by extension, it's for our faith as well. The death of Lazarus is so that they may believe. And so he says, okay, so now let's go. Who's with me? Now guess who's the first to speak up? I would have thought, okay, for sure. If I'm just like thinking through this, who's going to be the first to speak up? Peter, right? Peter, the guy with the foot-shaped mouth. Have you ever heard that before? Right? Peter. You think Peter is the first one. It's not Peter. Thomas, the guy we know is doubting Thomas. It's Thomas, look at verse 16. Therefore, Thomas, who is called Didymus, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go so that we may die with him. Wow, not so doubting Thomas, is he? This is like leadership Thomas. This is a Thomas that shows commitment to Christ even to the point of death. I mean, he's like, hey, let's go. If we die, we die. I think that's where Rocky IV, you've ever seen Rocky IV, right? Or Ivan Drago wants to take Rocky out. He just killed Apollo Creed. And Rocky says, if I die, I die. Right? I think he got it from here. It's biblical. Right? But the term Didymus means twin. Which is kind of funny because the word twin in the Aramaic is Tioma. You know what name we get from Tioma? Thomas. Thomas means twin. So we don't know who his twin was. We just know that he had a twin. We know that he has a couple of nicknames. We call him Ta Doubting Thomas. They didn't call him Doubting Thomas. They called him Thomas the Twin. Didymus. Kind of interesting. Thomas, historically, it says uh, that Thomas was killed in India. He was killed in India after he made a Hebrew or a Hebrew, a Hindu priest angry. He converted a bunch of Hindus. This guy got really mad. So he also insulted one of the Hindu priest deities and he dies because of it. He's so much more than we say, thank you, isn't he? I mean, we look at Thomas and we think immediately, oh, unless I, I won't believe unless I can put my finger into his nail holes and plunge my fist through his side. And he's the first one that says, if I die, I die. Let's go. Let's go with Jesus. If we die, we die. I mean, did he doubt? Sure, he doubted. He doubted for a moment. 
But it doesn't seem that doubt is what characterized this guy's life. Look at verse 17. So when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb four days. Kind of interesting when you look at the timeline of this is the timeline wise is, is Lazarus was already dead when Jesus got the news. Four days. So day one, the messenger comes with Jesus. That's the day Lazarus died. Day two, the messenger returns to Bethany. Day three, Jesus waits another day, which completely blows us away, right? Day four, Jesus arrives in Bethany and raises Lazarus from death. Four days. Four days of mourning. Four days of wondering why Jesus wouldn't come. Four days because there's a broader perspective and there's a bigger purpose. And if you've ever spent any time at all in the Middle East, you know how hot it is. Man, it's just brutally hot. And in that climate, I mean, decomposition would, would set in so quickly. So typically in that climate, as in many places around the world, that you usually bury a person the same day that they die. It's still true in many places in the world today. Look at verse 18. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them, console them concerning their brother. And listen, that's what we do today, right? There are many traditions we have that are common all around the world. That is, when somebody dies, then, then the loved ones will come and they'll spend time with them. They want to comfort those who have been left behind. One of the differences, I think, in our culture that we often do is that we, when we don't know what to say, we tend to say nothing and stay away. That's actually not real good. The, the saying nothing is probably good. But the staying away is not. Remember Job's friend when Job was hurting so bad? And so they came and sat with him for seven days, didn't say a word. Like, that was great. And then they started talking, like completely ruined it. Right? And when somebody dies, there's, there's a whole bunch of. Uh, there's not like a one right thing to say, you know what I mean? There's just a whole bunch of wrong things to say. And so it's usually better just, just to be there. And so that's what they're doing. They're just being there to comfort her. That's to be there. And, and since Bethany was only a couple miles from Jerusalem, it would make sense why there were so many Jews that came. There were so many people that would see this miracle. Look at verse 20. So Martha, therefore, when she had heard that Jesus was coming, went to meet him, but Mary stayed at the house. Martha then said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Now some take Martha as greeting as an accusation. If you'd have been here, then my brother wouldn't have died. Right? I don't think that's what she's saying. I, don't. I mean, how could she criticize him when he died, like the same day that he got the message? I think Martha, Martha's greeting is actually a confession of faith. I think she genuinely believed that Jesus could have healed her brother if he was there. Ah, oh, Jesus, if you were here, my brother wouldn't have died. That's so much different, isn't it? And she knows, and the Father will give the Son whatever he asks, and she also knows that Lazarus is going to be resurrected later. Just not now, right? Look at verse 23. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Again, bigger perspective, right? Broader perspective, bigger picture. She doesn't get it just yet. And so point number three is there's a better provision better provision, and the better provision is resurrection for life. Resurrection for life. Kind of funny, you know, we're about three quarters of the way through the sermon, and we're finally getting to the fifth I am statement here, verse 25. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even if he dies, and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And honestly, when you read this, you go, this sounds like a huge contradiction. How does somebody live even if he dies? And how can he say that if anyone believe, lives and believes in Christ, he'll never die? Like, isn't that a contradiction? No. Every believer has eternal life. This is an affirmation. You have eternal life. And so when your physical life ends, your spiritual body goes to be with the Lord, and your physical body stays here, and it looks like it's sleeping. What's it waiting for? Well, the resurrection comes to life. And because Jesus was resurrected, we'll be resurrected. Like, that's where our hope is at. Not our wish. It's, it's, it's a sure and certain thing. 
then he asks the question, do you believe this? Do you believe this? Verse 27, she said to him, yes, Lord, I have believed. You are the Christ, the Son of God, he who comes into the world. I mean, Martha, what a great woman of faith and a hard worker. We could actually do a three-point sermon just on this, right? On this confession, right? Look what she says. You are the Christ. You are the Son of God. You are the one who has come into the world. That's a three-part sermon right there. We can easily do that. She's got this great confession of faith, right? She's got all the right theology, and she still doesn't get what Jesus is about to do. Like, we know what he's going to do, because we've read the story, right? But she doesn't get it. Verse 28, And when she, said, when she had said this, she went away and called Mary, her sister, saying secretly, secretly, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and was coming to him. Now Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha met him. Now it seems from here that, that Jesus wants to have a private conversation with Mary. My guess is he would want to comfort her. He'd want to instruct her, right? I, I think it's interesting as a side note, like she, she calls him the teacher, right? And it's a great title, right? Because it would have been really unusual even someone called sinful for a Jewish rabbi to instruct a woman. And so maybe that's why it was so secretive. Not sinful, secretive. Look at verse 31. Then the Jews who were with her in the house and consoling her, when they saw that Mary got up quickly and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. Therefore, when Mary came where Jesus was, she saw him and fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Isn't that kind of an interesting thing? Like Jesus wants to have this private conversation, and so Mary kind of gets up secretly, and, you know, it's starting to go out. And everyone's like, oh, Mary's leaving. You know, I'll go follow her. You know, I get the picture of Mary going, can I, can I just get some time? Can I just get, you know, I don't, I don't need everybody here. But everybody comes, and so I think this makes a private meeting with Jesus impossible. But I love to see Mary's response here. Do you see it in 32? When Mary came, where Jesus was, she saw him, fell at his feet, saying, and Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. It's, it's the same thing with Martha, right? Same, same theology that Martha has. What I notice there too is she doesn't complain. She doesn't accuse him. What does she do? She fell at his feet as an act of worship. Like Martha, she believed Lazarus would still be alive if Jesus were there. And like Martha, her faith was sincere. She had good theology, but it was limited. Look at verse 33. And when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. Now these are some really powerful words here. It, 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 it really goes in stark contrast to the Greek gods of the day, right? Where, where they're apathetic and there's no emotion. Whereas Jesus is really emotional here. In fact, that, that term deeply moved can be translated groaned. It can be translated um, was angered. You only see this in the Greek five times in the New Testament. In, in, in Matthew 9 and Mark 1, it's translated, translated sternly warned. In Mark 14, they use the word saying they were scolding her, right? Same, same word. And in 33 and 38, it's translated deeply moved. The big question is then, why is he so deeply moved? I mean, think about it. He knows he's going to raise him from death. Why is he so deeply moved? Why is he so angered about this? Now, some will say, well, because of their unbelief or because of their hypocrisy. But I don't think so. I mean, Mary and Martha, really, are they being hypocrites? No, they get down. Yeah, well, we know he's going to be resurrected. They don't know. He's never done this before. I, I really think it's I think Jesus is really angry with Satan. Yeah. I think he's angry about this conflict of sin and death. And Paul would later say, be, be angry, but do not sin. That's the context behind the, the shortest verse in all the Bible, verse 35, Jesus wept. 
Jesus wept. Now, now this, 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 they use that word 33 about weeping, but it's, it's, a, it's actually a different word in 33. The word in 33 was more like loud wailing. The word in 35 is, is just a more quiet shedding of tears. Jesus wept. Not loudly wailing, trying to get attention, just quietly sobbing. Man, he loved these people. I mean, he is, he is deeply moved because his friend Lazarus died. He's deeply moved because of Mary and Martha are so sad. He's deeply moved because this whole thing with sin and death and the work of Satan, this really troubles him. And so the crowd sees him weeping, and, and look what they say in verse 36. So the Jews were saying, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man also from dying? They get your skeptics, even here. Verse 38. So Jesus again, being deeply moved within, came to the tomb. Now it was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, remove the stone. Martha, the sister, Martha, the sister of the deceased, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be a stench. For he has been dead four days. Now you got to realize this is a very dramatic scene here, right? If the stone was rolled away, you've got huge risk. There's a risk, number one, of being defiled according to the Old Testament law. They can't just go out and you know, hang out with a dead body. Like that's not okay. And then after four days, I mean, you would want to. This is the Middle East. He terribly decayed. And so you got Mary who, who's just weeping, and then you got Martha who's objecting. All right, this, this is a big deal. Verse 40. Jesus said to her, Did I not say to you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? Martha, didn't I tell you? This is my dad. But that's the best part of all. Martha, didn't you know? Like, this is what I was talking about. This is the best part of all. This sickness is not going to end in death. It's going to end for the glory of God so that the Son of God will be glorified. And, and Martha's not a silent of the bystander. She's not just going, oh, well, I'm not sure what I should do. Martha's walking by faith as well. Martha is the one who has to grant permission, otherwise the tomb doesn't get open. So here you got Martha, this woman of great faith, who's a hard worker, who's also saying, you know what I believe? Do you believe this? Yeah, I believe it. Verse 41. So they removed the stone. Then stone. Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but because of the people standing around, I said it. <laughs> Isn't that funny? We've been having this conversation, Dad, but I need to like say it out loud so these people will understand it. So that they may believe that you sent me. And I just love how Jesus thanks the Father for granting the request before he requested it. You ever prayed like that before? God, I thank you for the work that you're going to do. I thank you for the work that you're getting ready to do. Jesus wasn't putting himself out there like, oh, this is going to be really good. Everybody's going to you know, shout my name. He's not the miracle worker. He put himself out there as the Father's obedient son. And for the Father to grant this request, would clear, give clear evidence that the Father has sent the Son to do the Father's will and the people would believe as a result. This is really the kind of prayer that, uh, that Elijah prayed when fire came down from heaven. Remember that? Look at, verse, look at 1 Kings 18. Answer me, O Lord, answer me that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God and that you have turned their heart back again. Look at verse 43. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. St. Augustine once said that if Jesus had not said Lazarus' name, all of the graves would have opened up. That's great. Verse 44, Then the man who died had come, came forth, bound hand and foot with wrappings, and his face was wrapped around with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Unbind him and let him go. I don't, know, well, I don't know, I've seen different kids' videos and pictures and stuff. I don't know. Why would they need to unwrap him if he wasn't wrapped up? Like, how did he actually physically come out of the grave, right? 
You think he just kind of levitated and then he's just standing there and you got to unwrap him so now he can start moving his legs? I mean, this was like heavy layers of spices and wrappings and stuff. The text kind of indicates that he couldn't move on his own, so they had to take off his grave clothes, which is just kind of interesting. It's just conjecture to say what would happen, but I would say this. Jesus still speaks. He still calls spiritually dead people to come out of the grave and to enter into spiritual life. And many who are dead in their trespasses and sins believe. And they come to faith in Christ. It's like this man who stood in front of me and just, I want to repent and trust in Jesus right now. He got on his knees in front of all of his peers. He wanted Jesus for more than just the food that Jesus could give him. He wanted Jesus. And so our application really just kind of goes back to our three points. It's just three questions. Actually, it's four questions, sorry. What is it, number one, that God may be doing in your life well, all you see are the circumstances and not the broader perspective. Where's sickness for glory? Second question, what is it that God may be doing in your life where all you see are the circumstances and not the bigger purpose? How does God want to be glorified? Or how can God be glorified in the midst of your heartache right now? Could it be death for faith? Third question, what is it that God may be doing in your life where all you see are the circumstances and not the better provision? And I simply ask the question, is there any problem that the resurrection cannot solve? None that I can think of. And so the final one is we go to prayer. When was the last time you sat at the feet of Jesus and just listened to him with the heart that says, I want to obey you? And I want to believe. Our Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that you have reserved this tremendous miracle for your glory and for our good. Thank you for the hope that it brings to us. Our Father, I pray for this body of believers. Some I know are just struggling. There's so many difficult things going on in the life of our church right now. But I thank you that you've given us one another to love and to care and to comfort one another. I thank you that you've given us your word and your spirit that we might find grace and peace, and comfort and hope. Father, I thank you that you've given us your word. The light to our God. Father, take this time of worship and be pleased with it. We offer it to you in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together. We're the ones who join Mary in saying that we believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God who has come into the world. In the morning when I
partying, of planning, all this crazy Christmas season be marked with the peace that only Christ can give. Peace I give you, Jesus said. Peace not that the world can give. Then he breathed on his disciples his Holy Spirit. So my friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. See you at lunch.